Well, good afternoon, and welcome to the University of Wisconsin-Madison and to the Wisconsin Historical Society. I'm Ed Van Gemmert, the Vice Provost for Libraries and University Librarian here on campus. And we are, we are so honored to have such a prestigious guest in author Adam Hawkshield joining us this afternoon. But before we begin, I wanted to recognize those involved in coordinating our World War I commemorative events today. As 2014 is the centennial of the start of World War I, the libraries, along with its special collections, with partnership from the Wisconsin Historical Society, the University Archives, and the History Department's Mossy Program, decided to commemorate the war along with its impact. We were fortunate to have a special donor, Dr. Andrew Stengel, who's here with us today, step forward to provide us with several impressive period items, which now make up a significant portion of the exhibit on display in Special Collections in Memorial Library. The Wisconsin, the Wisconsin, excuse me, the Wisconsin Historical Society provided us with very interesting propaganda posters, which can be viewed in the main lobby of Memorial Library. In addition to these items, and with the help of Mr. John Tortorisi of the Mossy Program, two very talented graduate students, Eric O'Connor and Sky Doney, curated that exhibit. So, to John, Andrew, Eric, Sky, and everyone at the Historical Society, thank you for your dedication. Your work helps us provide the public with an exhibit that is sure to help demonstrate the significance and the impact of the war. Also, please, yes, thank you. Thank you for that. Please join us as well over in Special Collections Department on the ninth floor of Memorial Library immediately following this lecture for a special guided exhibit tour by Eric and Skye, a reception, and a book signing by Mr. Hawkshield. Now to introduce our guest speaker, I, I'd like to welcome Mr. Daniel Ushishkin, Assistant Professor of History here at UW-Madison. Thank you very much. Enjoy the time. It's a, a great honor and a great pleasure to introduce our uh, speaker today. Uh, there's no light here. <laughs> Adam Hofschild comes to us from the very fine city of Berkeley, uh, where he teaches at the Graduate School of Journalism. He is known to many of us as a distinguished uh, journalist, one of the founding <coughs> editors of Mother Jones, has been writing on political struggles, social justice issues, and historical memory. He is also one of the most well-known and most influential public historians today. Part historian, part ethnographer, he has written moving accounts of modern South Africa uh, and of uh, the silences and memories of Stalin's uh, gulags in Russia as well as a very moving autobiographical memoir of his uh, uh, of father and son. Many of you here have, uh, have read uh, his King Leopold's Ghost on the atrocities of the Belgian king's uh, colony in the Congo and the international humanitarian campaign that followed, as well as his uh, Bury the Chains, uh, law that is simply one of the best accounts we have of the campaign to abolish slavery in the British Empire at the end of the 18th century. His books received numerous awards, including the LA Times Book Prize, uh, Penn USA Literary Award, uh, the Gold Medal of California Book Awards, the Duff Cooper Prize, and many, many others, which I'm not going to uh, list here because it's going to take a long time. His books have generated far-reaching effects in the historical community and the public at large. Uh, one thinks of the international storm, for instance, that followed the publication of King Leopold's Ghost. Recognizing his enormous contributions to the historical profession uh, and to the way the history is written, discussed, or taught, and for his work to expand the space of the na and the nature of public history more broadly, he has been awarded the Distinguished American Historical Association Roosevelt Wilson Prize in 2009, more recently elected fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. As Hochschild himself explains, He's particularly drawn to writing about times and places when people felt moral imperative to confront evil, such as the atrocities in the Congo or Atlantic slavery. In all cases, I think, drawing new connections between 
new uh, types of, within actors, historical actors, some of them familiar, many of them less familiar or unfamiliar, and in fact, people whose work to confront evil would later be, for whatever reason, thrown into oblivion or silenced. In the end, Hochschild's work gets us to think about the ways in which individual lives are both shaped by the tide of historical forces around us, but can, and indeed do, resist and transform them. His histories are human in the best sense of the word, about the ethical commitments that drove women and men to join forces in order to confront the crimes of others. Which brings me to his latest book, uh, modestly, I think, titled To End All, All Wars, A Story of Loyalty and Rebellion, 1914-1918. It's often described as a book about those who opposed the war, but I think it is about a lot more. Written as a collective biography, bring together the military general with the Scottish miner, the socialist and the imperialist, East London and the Western Front. Hochschild, simply put, has written one of the best and most important books in the First World War in recent years. It is also a very timely book, and I'm not talking about the centenary, although this is, of course, the occasion for which we're all here, but the, in terms of the shifting terrain of historical memory of the war. In Europe, especially in its Western parts, especially in Britain, there is a new wave of history writing that seeks to rewrite the history of World War I as a necessary war, or on the uh, history of the carnage in the Western Front as the work of competent military uh, leadership. <laughs> the reasons for this are difficult to fathom. We can speculate, perhaps it is the distance from the events, perhaps the new emotional economy of nationalism at the dawn of the 21st century. In confronting this tide, in some sense virtually alone, Hochschild asks us to confront, to use one of his favorite words, I think, the ghosts of a futile war that are still with us today. Please join me in welcoming Adam Hochschild, who will talk to us about 1914-1914. Well, thank you very much, Daniel, for a very generous uh, introduction. It's great to be back here in Madison once again. For those of you who are standing, there are at least three seats here down in front that I see, and uh, a few more over there. Maybe anybody sitting next to a vacant seat, if you want to raise your hand at all. Let some of those folks who are standing, if they're looking for seats, find them. Um, so here we are, a hundred years after the beginning of the First World War, a war which I think we can fairly say remade our world for the worse uh, in almost every conceivable way. Uh, how should we look back up? Uh, with the aid of some pictures, I want to share some thoughts on that subject with you. Uh, it's a war that has long been a personal obsession of mine, uh, and there are good reasons for being obsessed by it, I think. The military and civilian death toll together was more than 20 million, which is six times the toll of any previous war uh, in Europe. In addition, there were an even larger number of wounded. And more than that, the war left behind it something that's become all too familiar today, but which was really something relatively new for Europe at that time, which was an immense amount of destruction. Uh, this was really the first time that uh, Europe experienced something that we have seen all too often since then, which is the immense destructive power of large numbers of high explosive shells. In the First World War, it was particularly devastating because as the armies advanced and retreated on each side, as each army retreated, uh, they destroyed everything behind them that could be of any possible use to the advancing enemy. That meant blowing up buildings, cutting down fruit trees, uh, poisoning the wells, leaving scorched earth in every respect. Now, I also have a personal reason for being obsessed with the First World War, which is that an uncle of mine fought in it. This is him in this picture, in the center of this picture, with his fighter squadron of the Imperial Russian Air Force. Uh, he was a fighter pilot, and if you look closely, you can see a white cross dangling from around his neck. That is the cross of the Order of St. George, 
which entitled the bear, it was the highest decoration awarded by the Russian Empire, and it entitled the bearer to a personal audience with the Tsar at any time of day or night. <laughs> a privilege which was not of much use after 1917. <laughs> uh, because one of the things about this war, of course, is that it swept several empires away. Not just the Russian Empire, but also the German Empire. That's Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany uh, marching in a parade with his six sons. Uh, <coughs> just look at those hats. <laughs> There's something about that that to me telegraphs the kind of imperial self-confidence of Europe at that time uh, that was vanished forever after 1914. That's the Kaiser's wife and her daughter. You can't say nobody ever wore hats like that again, but there's something about the age that created them that is no longer with us. And of course, it wasn't just um, the Russian and German empires that got swept away, but the Austro-Hungarian Empire got broken up into many pieces. The Ottoman Empire of Turkey uh, vanished as well. Now, this was a war that, like so many wars, including some of the ones we've been in recently, began with an illusion. There were several illusions, and one of them was the illusion of quick and easy victory. These are students in Berlin marching off to enlist in 1914. Here they are getting into a railway car, and if you look closely on the side, you can see it says, to Paris. Here are Frenchmen rejoicing with equal enthusiasm at the beginning of the war, August 1914. Here's a railway car that took some of them to the front, and on the side it says, to Berlin. So that was the first illusion, quick and easy victory. Uh, an all too common one that helps wars begin. The second illusion, I think, in 1914, I can only describe as the belief that you would be shooting at the enemy, but they would not be shooting at you. <laughs> now, that may sound silly, but how else can you explain the color of the uniforms with which several million French infantrymen walk, marched off to battle in 1914. These are not the dress uniforms. These are the combat uniforms. Bright red hats, bright blue coats, bright red pants. Uh, similarly, the Austro-Hungarian cavalry were very fond of bright red and blue, and they kept wearing those uniforms until 1916. A third illusion was that the cavalry itself could play a role in industrialized war warfare. Every nation entering the war had thousands, tens of thousands of armed soldiers on horseback, French cavalry here. Uh, these are the famous German Ulan Lancers. When the Germans invaded France and Belgium in 1914, they did so with eight cavalry divisions uh, with a total of 40,000 men on horseback. Here's a British cavalryman, cavalryman practicing for those great glorious charges that everybody expected to happen. Now, where did the illusion about cavalry come from? I think very simply because for several thousand years, cavalry had been uh, not only an important part of warfare, but often the decisive uh, arm in warfare. It was also a major path to military glory Cavalry officers tended to get promoted uh, faster than those in other branches of service. And people are very unwilling to grasp it when something like that changes. Now, I think all three illusions, quick and easy victory, the other side not shooting at you, the cavalry, also were very strongly enhanced by the fact that when the war began in 1914, the previous military experience of almost all British, French, and German officers had been in colonial warfare. Look, for instance, at this panorama celebrating the British war in the Sudan, 1898. Uh, 
First of all, victory in that war was quickly and easy. easy. Second, there was a role for the cavalry. You see the guy on horseback in the middle of the, the, uh, the picture. Winston Churchill actually was a cavalryman in that war. And the third thing, the other side isn't shooting at you because they've just got spears and, and swords. And if you look carefully, the British not only have repeating rifles, they've got steamboats in the background, there's a, a railroad train in the far background, um, and of course they have the machine gun as well. Now, intellectually, people in Europe knew that they would not be going to war uh, you know, in France and Belgium against poorly armed Africans or Asians, but somehow emotions, habits, the ways that armies think collectively are hard to change, and I think they all expected some of the same uh, conditions as they'd had in colonial wars. Um, all of those illusions ran up very quickly against uh, two of the greatest defensive weapons of all time, barbed wire, which of course rendered cavalry charges totally obsolete and made it also very difficult for infantry to advance, uh, and the machine gun. And instead of those glorious cavalry charges that everybody had long dreamed of, uh, on the Western Front, both sides uh, got virtually frozen in place on that front line that went from the English Channel uh, to the Swiss border. And despite huge battles uh, for more than three years, it barely moved more than a few miles in either direction. For example, 1915, which was a year that saw several major Allied attacks, probably during the course of that year, more than uh, a million soldiers were killed and wounded on both sides on the Western Front. The Allies gained, by the end of the year, exactly eight square miles of ground. And instead of having those glorious cavalry charges, people found themselves fighting in, uh, from these trenches. This is an aerial view of one of those uh, trenches from the air. The white that you see there, incidentally, is chalk and the soil. The soil is very chalky in parts of France and Belgium. And instead of the cavalry charges, they found themselves in this absolutely devastated landscape. Along the area of the old Western Front, more than, this, this by the way used to be a forest, more than 700 million artillery and mortar shells were fired over the course of uh, four and a half years, and this is what the land looked like afterwards. Men also found themselves sharing space with corpses, sharing space below ground with rats. These are German soldiers with the rat, rats that they've caught. And they very often found themselves fighting knee-deep in mud. They also found themselves up against all sorts of terrifying new weapons that they hadn't anticipated, uh, like the flamethrower or like poison gas. And there were defenses against it improvised, but they didn't always work. Uh, people couldn't get their gas masks on in time or they didn't have them initially. Uh, these British soldiers were blinded by a gas attack in uh, 1918. That's why each man has his hands on the shoulders of the man in front. Uh, most of the wounded, though, were wounded by bullets and shrapnel. And all you have to do is look at one picture and then multiply it in your mind by 21 million, which is the number of soldiers who were wounded in that war. Now, these horrors, I think, um, changed in a big way the conversation that people had with each other about the future of the human race. <coughs> Cartoons like this one began appearing during the war itself. Um, the era of Victorian optimism, I think, was gone forever, and something much darker took its place. This was an effect uh, that one could feel from the war just not long after it began. Now, there's another curious uh, thing about this war, which is this. Uh, wars 
are usually fought by the poor. Uh, when you think back at the recent wars that the United States has been involved in, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, very, very few Ivy Leaguers, very few children of senators or CEOs uh, involved in these conflicts. In the First World War, it was the exact opposite. These men in this picture are cadets at Eton, Britain's most exclusive school, drilling in 1915. The following year, 1916, more than 30 Eton graduates were killed in a single day July 1st, 1916, uh, the first day of the Battle of the Somme. And wherever you look, these statistics uh, are similar. Uh, for example, men who graduated from Oxford in 1913, 31% were killed. Uh, the elite died in a higher proportion than did the lower class, the working class, which is a somewhat unusual thing. Why? because it was young captains and lieutenants who led their men out of the trenches into that hail of machine gun fire. And officers traditionally came from the upper classes. Part of that is traditions that go back hundreds of years. Part of it also was that, that fact of where the officers came from was reinforced, I think, by the fact that during the half century preceding the outbreak of war in 1915, uh, European armies had very frequently, countries on both sides, been used as strike breakers. And obviously, uh, you couldn't risk having officers of working class background because, heaven forbid, they might side with the strikers. Uh, and so officers almost always came from the aristocracy. Uh, or the upper classes, like these French cavalry officers here, uh, photographed taken in maneuvers before the war. The power of that tradition was very strong, and many people wanted their sons to become officers. Rudyard Kipling, for example, Britain's most famous writer at the time, uh, a great enthusiast for this war, and indeed for all wars that Britain ever fought. Uh, he had long encouraged a love of things military, and his son John, who's probably about four years old in this picture, uh, John set his heart on a military career, had trouble getting into the army because he inherited his father's bad eyesight. You know how Kipling has those very thick glasses in any photograph you see of him. Uh, but finally, his father pulled strings. Uh, John Kipling got commissioned at the age of 18 uh, as a second lieutenant. And on the, in 1915, on the first day of the Battle of Luce, he went into action and was never seen again. Uh, <clears throat> just one more example, also from Britain, of the toll that the war took on the country's uh, elite. This is Hatfield House, which is one of the great old British country homes, long the seat of the Cecil family. The patriarch of that family, uh, Lord Salisbury, was prime minister of Britain for many years at the turn of the century. He had 10 grandsons. Five of them were killed in the war. Here's one, uh, George Cecil, who died at the age of 18 just a few weeks after the war began. The toll went through the elites of all countries. Uh, Prime Minister Herbert Asquith of Britain lost a son. So did his counterpart, Chancellor Theobald von bethmann holdig of Germany. The man in the middle in this picture, uh, General Sir Herbert Lawrence, who was chief of staff of the British Army on the Western Front, lost two sons. His counterpart in the French Army, General Noel de Castelnau, lost three sons. So in order to really understand this war, we have to understand the illusions that led men like that to literally send their own sons into battle day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, for four and a half years. There's another aspect <coughs> of the war that I want to turn to now, which has to do 
with its effect on the civilian population. Uh, one of the things about this war is that it involved the civilian populations in a way that no war before it had. Partly because it lasted so long, partly because trying to deprive the other side's <coughs> civilian population of food became one of the weapons of the war. German submarines sinking ships heading for Britain and France, the Allies imposing a naval blockade on Germany. One of the effects was a tremendous growth in spy mania, great paranoia. Uh, it's hard to keep up fervor in a civilian population for four and a half years. When things go wrong, people want to have somebody to blame. Uh, both in Britain and the United States, there was a wave of violence against shops that had German names. You know, it could be that the owner immigrated from Germany two or three, you know, two or three generations back, but there were thousands of cases of shop windows being smashed, people being beaten up in one way or another. Um, <clears throat> the war also affected the civilian population by creating refugees on a vast scale. Uh, these ones in this picture happen to be from Belgium, but there was actually a far larger number of refugees created in Eastern Europe and the Middle East. And one of the things that they were fleeing uh, was the prospect of being turned into forced laborers by their occupiers. Uh, because the, the Germans and Austro-Hungarians in territory they occupied, they put people to work in war industries, often shipping them uh, off to Germany to do so. This was something new uh, in the landscape of war for Europe. And with it came something that's also been all too familiar to us since then, which was the beginnings of a kind of totalitarian control of civilian populations. For example, uh, in 1915, the Germans built an electrified fence on the border between Belgium and Holland to prevent people who were worried about getting conscripted as forced laborers from escaping to Holland, which was neutral. Uh, and more than 300 people, it was electrified at, at 2,000 volts, uh, several hundred people died trying to cross it. Uh, and this, of course, would not be the last electrified fence seen in Europe in that century. Now, the very madness of all this makes me very much respect the people at the time who resisted it, who saw the war as madness, who understood some of these consequences, uh, and who spoke out at that time. And in all of the major countries, there were such people. In the United States, for example, the labor leader, Eugene V. Debs, spoke out very strongly against the war once the US entered in 1917. Because of this, uh, he was sentenced to prison in 1918. And he was still in prison in November of 1920 when he received nearly a million votes for president on the socialist ticket. <coughs> Another American, the pioneer social worker Jane Addams, organized at The Hague in Holland, Holland being neutral, uh, a conference in 1915 of women from both sides. And needless to say, governments on both sides uh, did all sorts of things, not completely successfully, to try to prevent their women from going there. Uh, more than 500 Americans refused to go uh, <clears throat> into the armed forces and were imprisoned, like these two men at Fort Riley, Kansas. In Germany, radicals like Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht uh, opposed the war and went to jail as a result. In France, the great socialist leader Jean Jaurès uh, spoke out very strongly against the war that he saw coming. Uh, on the eve of the war, in uh, a week before it began, he and the leaders of Europe's other left-wing uh, parties called an emergency conference in Brussels. Uh, Jaurès went there. Uh, they met. They frantically debated how they could stop the war they feared was going to start. Uh, 
before an enormous crowd in an open plaza there, Jory stood with his arm around the leader of the German socialists and said, we will never make war on each other. And because of that, three days later, when he returned to France, he was assassinated. And three days after that, the war began. Now, the war that resistors like this uh, opposed uh, was accompanied by an enormous barrage of propaganda. This was the first big propaganda war, again because of the necessity to keep up that war fervor in the civilian population on both sides. This is a US Army recruiting poster. Here's a poster uh, <clears throat> from Germany uh, with God for, for king and, and, and country. God, of course, is always <coughs> invoked by both sides. Here's a poster trying to get Australians aroused about the possibility of a German invasion there, if you can imagine. Uh, but this propaganda always had an edge to it. Uh, if you uh, didn't eagerly volunteer to fight, you were letting down the women. You were <coughs> cowardly or guilty. And worst of all, you were effeminate. So there was a nastiness to the propaganda, and I think it makes me respect the courage of the resistors all the more because of that. Now, for various reasons, there were more resistors in Great Britain than anywhere else. And so I want to focus on that country for, <clears throat> for a moment. Uh, more than 20,000 British men of military age refused to allow themselves to be drafted into the army. And many of them, as a matter of principle, also refused the alternative service that was offered for conscientious objectors, because that could mean uh, being given a job driving an ambulance at the front or working in a war industry. As a result, more than 6,000 of them went to prison uh, like this prison, which is uh, Wandsworth in southwest London, those metal nets you can see across the opening are to prevent people from committing suicide by jumping over the balcony. And they were an extraordinary group of people. Uh, here's one of them, uh, Fenner Brockway, who before the war was a newspaper editor. When he went to jail as a war resistor, he continued editing a newspaper for his fellow prisoners, a clandestine paper, on toilet paper. It <clears throat> was produced for a year before the authorities discovered it, shut it down, and put him in solitary confinement for the remainder of the conflict. Uh, Bertrand Russell, uh, <clears throat> Britain's most distinguished philosopher, uh, and I want to read you a few things he said because one of the things that I respect so much about Russell is that he was open about the conflict of feelings that he felt. He described himself at the start of the war as being tortured by patriotism, for I desired the defeat of Germany as ardently as any retired colonel. Love of England is very nearly the strongest emotion I possess. And in appearing to set it aside at such a moment, I was making a very difficult renunciation. He also wrote <coughs> about how hard it was to resist being swept away when the whole nation is in a state of violent collective excitement. As much effort was required to avoid sharing this excitement as would have been needed to stand out against the extreme of hunger or sexual passion and there was the same feeling of going against instinct. He spent six months in prison for his opposition to the war. Someone else who spent six months in prison was uh, <clears throat> Britain's leading investigative journalist, Edmund Dean Morell. If any of you have read my book, King Leopold's Ghost, you'll remember him as very much the hero of that story. He served his six months prison sentence at hard labor. It broke his health and he died a few years later of a heart attack at the age of 51. Here's uh, <clears throat> another uh, war resistor in England, Charlotte Despard, uh, one of these wonderful, feisty, eccentric uh, British radicals. Uh, she was active in all the movements for social change of her day. Uh, 
uh, went to jail four times in the battle for women's suffrage, uh, uh, <clears throat> believed in independence for, for India, independence for Ireland. Uh, once the war began, she traveled up and down the country speaking against it. Her rallies were often uh, broken up by mobs throwing stones or shut mm -hmm. down by the police. She visited the families of war resistors in jail trying to keep her spirits up. Uh, this was a time, though, in Britain where, as we experienced here during the Vietnam War, families were often divided. For, amazingly, uh, Charlotte Despard's brother, John French, was commander-in-chief on the Western Front. Uh, and as soon as I discovered them, I thought, wow, that's going to be an interesting relationship to write about. Uh, and indeed it was. Curiously, although each of them had had several biographies written of them, his biographers tended to be military historians who were a little embarrassed by the fact that their subject had this raging feminist radical sister, and they barely mentioned her. Her biographers <laughs> tended to be feminists who <clears throat> were a little embarrassed by the fact that she had this field marshal brother. So the biographers were not interested in the relationship. I was. Uh, <clears throat> and. Curiously, this brother and sister were very fond of each other, despite their uh, enormous differences in politics. They continued to see each other throughout the war. Um, they stopped speaking only in 1918, because that year Britain faced a nationalist uprising in Ireland, and they thought that a military man with a strong hand was needed to suppress it, so they sent Sir John to Ireland as viceroy. Uh, she went to Ireland to work for the IRA. <laughs> and they stopped speaking. Another British war resistor is a woman named Emily Hobhouse, who did something quite remarkable. In 1916, she crossed the English Channel to France, and then she went from France to Switzerland, which was neutral. Then she went from Switzerland into Germany, and in Germany, she went to, Ber to Berlin and went to call on the German foreign minister, whom she had known slightly before the war. And she began talking about peace terms. You know, if we did this, might you do that, and so forth. This totally unsent by the British government or anything. She thought she had, wrongly, I think, the outlines of a possible peace settlement that the, Germ that the Germans might accept returned to Switzerland, to France, to England, uh, <clears throat> tried and failed to see people high in the British government who were horrified uh, that she had gone to Germany, and uh, wrote her off as a complete eccentric but uh, and a crackpot. But I think she deserves a place in history because in this war that killed so many millions of people, she is the only human being who went from one side to the other and back again in search of peace. Here's my favorite war resistor of all, uh, a man named John S. Clark, who was born to a circus family in Scotland. And at the age of 17, he went into the ring and became the youngest lion tamer in Great Britain. Uh, then he got deeply involved in radical politics. Uh, very opposed to the war. In 1915, a friendly policeman tipped him off that he was about to be arrested, about to be arrested. He went underground. For the remainder of the war, he continued writing for and editing an anti-war newspaper that the government tried to shut down, but they could never find where it was published from. Uh, they didn't succeed in shutting it down or in catching him. After the war, he surfaced. Uh, eventually became a Labor Party member of Parliament, spent the last decade of his life on the Glasgow City Council, and whenever a circus came to town, he would go back into the ring, and at that point he was the oldest lion tamer. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the joys of writing history, that you find people like this, you, you couldn't make them up. So the war that these people opposed caused unprecedented suffering. And it spread across the world. Uh, from the very beginning, of course, in Europe, it had happened not just on the Western Front, uh, but also in Eastern Europe and Russia. These are Cossacks in this picture here. 
It spread, of course, to the sea. This is a British freighter being sunk by a submarine torpedo hitting it in the Mediterranean. 700 sailors died when this German warship was sunk in 1915. The war spread to Africa, where each side was eager to seize the other's colonies. Uh, and actually, the first shots of the war fired by British soldiers were not fired in France or Belgium, but in Togoland, a German colony in West Africa. Uh, the war was devastating in Africa. More than two million Africans were conscripted as porters for the rival armies. Uh, one out of five of them died, which is a higher death rate than there was on the Western Front. War spread <clears throat> to the Middle East. This is an Australian military camp at the base of the pyramids. The war also encompassed the world in a different way in that with so many soldiers being killed, uh, Britain and France, which still had access to their colonies, the Germans were cut off because they didn't control the ocean, brought more than half a million uh, <coughs> troops and laborers from their colonies uh, to Europe to fight and to do work for the armies. Uh, these are Algerian troops in France. But despite all this, still, <clears throat> there was a shortage of soldiers. So many were killed that by 1918, the British were drafting 17-year-olds, and the Germans were putting boys who were still younger into uniform. And still, the war went on and on and on. By the end, <clears throat> there were more than 9 million military dead, and depending on how you count them or really estimate them, uh, anywhere from 9 to 12 million civilian deaths. And that, of course, was not the only consequence of the war. Um, the even worse consequences uh, that unfolded over a longer time period, I think, were <coughs> those caused by the man shown on the far right in this picture with his German World War I German army unit, who uh, <clears throat> two decades later, led the world into an even more destructive war and the Holocaust as well. And it is very hard to imagine the Second World War happening without the first. Uh, another unexpected consequence of the First World War, I think, was the Russian Revolution. Russia would not have lasted that long, I don't think, uh, into the 20th century as an absolute monarchy. There would have been some sort of upheaval there in any case. But I think without the tremendous stress brought by the war, uh, it would not have been the most extreme and intolerant group of revolutionaries who came to power uh, with disastrous consequences for that country when millions of people ended up locked up in gulag camps like this. So when we look back on the war, uh, I want us to remember not just the politicians and not just the generals, but those who tried to stop it. Uh, even if they were unsuccessful, I think we can still take inspiration from them. So I want to end by doing two things. I'm going to show you some documentary film footage from the First World War. And while it's playing, I'm going to play you some music. It's a song some of you may know called The Green Fields of France. And it's sung by, uh, it was written by the Scottish songwriter Eric Bogle who says it was inspired by a visit to one of these vast First World War cemeteries, which some of you have probably seen, that stretch across uh, northern France and Belgium. And he noticed the name of a soldier on a tombstone, McBride, and the song is addressed to him. So listen to the words of the song. How do you do, young Willie McBride? Do you mind if I sit here down by your great side and rest for a while near the warm summer sun? 
I've been walking all day And I'm nearly done I see by your gravestone You were only 19 When you joined the Great Fallen In 1916 I hope you died well And I hope you died clean Our young Willie McBride Was it slow and unseen Did they beat the drum slowly Did they play the fight lowly the death march as they lowered you down Did the band play the last post and chorus Did the pipes play the flowers on the far Did you leave a wife or a sweetheart behind in some faithful heart is your memory and shrine Although you died back in 1916 In that faithful heart are you forever 19 But are you a stranger without even a name Enclosed them forever behind the glass frame in an old photograph Torn, battered and stained And faded to yellow In a brown leather frame Did they beat the drum slowly? Did they play the pipe lowly? Did they sound the death march As they lowered you down? Did the band play the last post and chorus? The pipes to lay the flowers of the forest. The sun now it shines on the green fields of France. There's a warm summer breeze makes the red poppies dance. And look how the sun shines from under the clouds there's no gas no barbed wire there's no gun firing now but here in this graveyard it's still no man's land the countless white crosses stand mute in the sand to man's blind indifference to his fellow man to a whole generation that were butchered and down. Did they beat the drum slowly? Did they play the fight lowly? Did they sound the dead march as they lowered you down? Did the band play the last post and chorus? Did the pipes play the flowers all?
So that's it. If you have comments or questions, I'd be glad to hear them. Okay, let me repeat the question. Britain and Germany were each other's best customers in 1914. True. Usually you don't go to war with your best customer. Also true. <laughs> Why did they go to war? Uh, you know, it's true that a lot of the usual explanations don't apply here. There was certainly no push at all from the British uh, business elite to start this war. In fact, the Prime Minister made a note in his diary in uh, uh, <clears throat> July of 1918, the city, meaning the Financial District of London, does not want war. Uh, the German elite was somewhat more divided, although they assumed, incorrectly of course, that Britain would stay out of the war. Their real concern was Russia. And there was uh, a lot of people in Germany who saw that what they wanted to accomplish from the war is deciding, is making it, it clear that for once and for all that it would be Germany and not Russia, which would be the influential power uh, in Eastern Europe. Why the war started is a very complicated question uh, that involves a chain of events that <coughs> began, of course, with the assassination of the Archduke uh, Austria-Hungary in Sarajevo, uh, <clears throat> June 28, 1914, and six weeks later the country, the whole continent was in flames. It's a complicated explanation, one piece leading to another, and we'd be here all night if I tried to run <laughs> through it. I think that what I would just emphasize is this was a war that did not have to happen. Ne no major country in Europe openly claimed a piece of another's territory. Uh, they all had tight trading ties. There were 50,000 Germans who were working in Britain because wages were slightly higher there. The royal families of, of Russia and Germany had gone on yachting holidays together in, in the Baltic. And royal families had influence in those days. Um, but it was a chain of accidents, and I come back to those delusions that I mentioned, I think were prime factors in why the war started. Yeah. I think it's fitting that you end uh, your presentation with the green fields of France. And it's also very fitting to note that it's also been translated uh, into German, and you can find several versions of it on uh, YouTube. I guess my question is this. Um, do you think that it was the fact that so many upper class uh, individuals uh, were killed uh, in the First World War that was the cause of the uh, over extreme pacifism that prevailed in Britain and France in the 1930s that you know led to a more bloody war ultimately? Good question. The question is, is the fact that there were so many upper class people killed in the war, is that what led to the pacifism of the 1930s, which was a factor in you know, appeasing Hitler and allowing the Second World War to start? Uh, possibly yes, uh, because certainly the uh, uh, appeasement policies of the 1930s in Britain and France were much more an upper class and right wing thing than they were left wing and lower class. But the collective trauma that both those countries had had from the war was so vast that it's hard to trace all of the effects that it had. Yeah. And uh, it would be even more amazing that the, or what was it, the King of England, the Kaiser, and the Tsar, they were, they were cousins. <laughs> they, they were all related, that's yeah. right. <laughs> Before it was their grandmother. The, the, the King, the Kaiser, and the Tsar were all, were all cousins, and they all knew each other. Uh, but still, that was not enough to stop it. I should maybe just say a little bit more about, I think, why the war got started so easily. Um, I mentioned the illusions, uh, quick and easy victory, uh, <coughs> and so forth. 
But there were a couple of other factors. One was that, with the exception of Britain, all of the other countries had most of their forces in reserve. That is, only a portion of the army was on active duty. The remainder were men who had spent two or three years of military service, but were in the reserves, you know, like National Guardsmen here, who could be called up. And it took about two weeks to fully mobilize one's reserves, longer in the case of Russia, which was a much larger country and more badly organized. And you had a tremendous head start if you could start mobilizing your reserves before the other guy. You also had an advantage if you attacked first, because that meant the fighting was likely to take place on the other country's territory. So I think those were factors that added to the momentum. Were there any war crime trials after the war? Were there any war crime trials after the war? No. There should have been, but uh, there weren't. <laughs> uh, it's curious to say what the war crimes of the First World War were. Uh, there were, you know, some a lot of harsh crimes against civilians uh, committed by the German occupiers of France and of the various parts of Eastern Europe that they occupied. But I think the real crime was that uh, the generals on both sides kept sending these young men <coughs> out to what eventually became their deaths, uh, and sometimes even measured their successes that way. Uh, <clears throat> for example, Field Marshal Haig, who was British commander-in-chief uh, for the latter half of the war, uh, had no way of telling what German casualties were after a particular battle uh, or a day of battle. He, of course, knew what the British casualties were. He had no way of telling what the German casualties were, but he always guessed that they must be roughly equal to those of the British. So when his own troops had relatively few ca casualties, he berated his generals. You know, why is it that you know, only 500 men were killed in yesterday's fighting? And you can actually find this stuff on paper. It's amazing. Yeah? Uh, so given the fact that um, a lot of the troops were fighting in very close proximity, The question is, did the perception of the enemy uh, differ between people back home who were seeing newspapers and propaganda and the troops who were actually in close proximity uh, to each other and could sometimes, in fact, shout back and forth to each other? I think there was, because anybody who was in a frontline trench, you know, up to his ankles in, in cold, muddy water, knew that on the other side, uh, the German or the Frenchman or whoever was there was also probably in the same position. Uh, and there are a lot of accounts, in fact, somebody did a whole book on this, of about informal truces along the front lines where soldiers kind of worked out, sometimes by shouts or signals, uh, to each other and understanding that they would shoot, but they would aim high. Or you pretty soon learned that if you fired off a lot of bullets at the German trench, but aimed them high, when the Germans shot at you, they'd be likely to do the same thing. Uh, one signal the soldiers worked out uh, was that this, you know, to act differently because an officer was coming, <laughs> is that they would somebody would stand up and pointed his shoulders where the officer's shoulders were. And then the other side knew they had to hunker down and the, you know, there might really be bullets coming out. Uh, and there are accounts of soldiers shouting back and forth, exchanging information, um, and so on. So I think men at the front at least knew that the soldiers on the other side were enduring the same conditions they were. Yeah? My father was a soldier in France. Um, he was a farm boy from Fond du Lac County, and he came back, he'd gotten mustard gas and shrapnel. Uh, but he said the worst part of being in those trenches was 
what he called the cooties and the lice and the dysentery. Does that come out in your readings? And Very definitely. This lady says that her father was a soldier in France and got gassed there and said that the worst experience of being in the trenches was the, the mud, the lice, and the dysentery. And that certainly comes through in the accounts that, that one reads. Because it's, uh, uh, and there's much one could add to that picture too, it's an extraordinary thing when you have to keep millions of men living essentially underground in makeshift shelters month after month after month uh, in a part of the world where it rains a lot and where in parts of Belgium the water table is only about two feet below ground. You have to dig a trench you know, deeper than that and be constantly pumping or else wading through it uh, you know, in water up to your knees or ankles. Um, in addition, being in these crowded, damp conditions uh, meant contag contagious diseases could spread very quickly. And of course, the most deadly one was the influenza epidemic of 1918-1919, uh, which killed tens of millions of people all over the world, but which was, whose spread was intimately tied to the war. It was first medically noticed at a US Army camp in Kansas, and then they could trace the vectors of its spreading by out from the port of Brest in France, which was where the American troops landed. All, yeah. of, that, all of that said and known, um, and knowing that there was some <coughs> mutiny, such as the French Army mutiny, why do you think the common soldier kept fighting? Was there a moral reason? Was it what was driving them? Question was why the common soldier kept fighting and why there weren't more mutinies like the French Army Mutiny of, of 1917. Uh, I think that, of course, the common soldier didn't keep fighting in all circumstances. In the year 1917, more than a million Russian soldiers simply left the front and walked home. And that's why <coughs> the Germans essentially were able to dictate the peace terms in the East, that the Russian army basically just melted away. Uh, there were also, as you mentioned, the French army mutinies uh, that same year in 1917, which were not a complete mutiny. The French soldiers didn't desert en masse, but they refused to take part in further attacks. Uh, and. Uh, towards the very end of the war, the last weeks of the war, there was a tremendous amount of desertion on the German side, not at the front, but in the rear. Uh, after the Germans had uh, uh, <coughs> essentially dictated the terms for the end of the war in the East with Russia, they had a million or so <coughs> troops there that they were eager to ship across Germany uh, and uh, put them to work fighting in the West. And a lot of those trains left with many more soldiers on them than got off when they got to the Western Front. Uh, so that there were some cases of, of, of men deserting and not fighting. But one does wonder why there wasn't more. And uh, I think there are many answers to that. Uh, a lot of it, I think, was that people felt if they deserted, they were letting down, not so much letting down their country, but letting down their friends. The, one of the things that holds armies together is that tremendous sense of bonding that people experience in any kind of, of military <coughs> unit. And if you decide to run away and go home, you're not just letting down the, the, your country, you're letting down a bunch of your friends who <coughs> maybe did something for you. Maybe they pulled you off the battlefield when you were wounded, or you knew they would you know, risk getting hurt themselves to pull you off the battlefield if, if you were wounded. In addition, there was draconian military discipline. Uh, the British Army, for example, uh, executed more than 300 soldiers for uh, desertion, cowardice, laying down <coughs> arms, uh, and you know, Running away is not an unreasonable thing to do if you see an overwhelming enemy attack coming at you. Uh, so people feared that draconian discipline as well. Uh, 
the armies, when they attacked, they quite frequently had a line of so-called battle police, that is, armed soldiers behind the soldiers who were advancing, uh, ready to shoot anybody who turned back. That so, was the role of cavalry, supposedly. You say the role of battle police was the role of cavalry, supposedly. Yeah, but they couldn't really use the cavalry to do that on the Western Front. The ground was too ripped up. We have time for one more question. I know you said you really didn't want to get into the causes of the war. My understanding is there were a lot of overlapping alliances and you know mutual defense treaties. How old were they? Did those arise like from concerns after the Franco-Prussian War, or were they more recent? Question was about the the role of alliances in causing the war and where the alliances came from. Um, I don't know the full history of all the alliances, uh, but certainly, in, in many ways, the crucial one was the Franco-Russian alliance. France was very eager to be allied with Russia because France had lost the Franco-Prussian War to Germany, and they had lost the provinces of Alsace and Lorraine, which were dear to the hearts of many people in France, and they were eager to have Russia as an ally, somebody who would agree to come to their aid if France were, were attacked. Uh, Russia had its own motives for wanting to be in that alliance, uh, one of them being that the Russian military was terribly eager to avenge the horrible humiliation of having lost a war to an Oriental power in 1905 when they lost the Russo-Japanese War. So the Russian military was desperately eager to show that it could fight a war as well as anybody else. And uh, there were close ties between the Russian elite and France, and they were, they were very eager to befriend the French. So, but the fact of these alliances, uh, the fact that there were countries obligated to jump in if one of their allies was attacked, certainly was one of the things that led to the rapid start uh, of the war. And I think without the alliances, it would not have started so quickly. So that's it. Thank you.